Wanna find great? Follow me. New listings. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find it on Yelp. Yelp has a range of great traders and suppliers. Those are artists. Let me take you to the painters. There you go. And welcome to the Entrepreneur Bootcamp, which is brought to you by, by YEP. Over the last uh, few weeks, uh, most of you, I'd imagine, um, have seen and, and, and has come through the journey through us. We started off uh, about six weeks ago looking at the opportunity. How do you, how do you spot the opportunity uh, if you want to start a business? Once you've spot the opportunity, how do you get started? And then once you got started, what do you build and how do you build it? Once you've built it, you then have to think about launching, marketing, sales. And then once you start to get clients and you start to build up some, some of a bit of a war chase, you've got to think about more funding so that you can scale the business. So today, in the very last installment of this entrepreneurial bootcamp, we are going to finally look at how do you commercially manage it. This is where everything comes together and you as the CEO, the owner of the business, need to pull everything together so that you can start to, to, to thrive and, and to really add value to your community. We've got an amazing uh, group of leaders and business owners joining us today to help me unpack this whole concept of commercial management. And in a, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce them one by one. And as I introduce them, they will come on screen and they will each give us a brief overview of who they are and what they do in business. Before I do so, I want to encourage everybody to stay until the end. We are going to announce two lucky winners uh, who will each receive a 500 Rand Take A Lot voucher. So, you know, come with your questions, uh, you know, engage with us. We are here for you this afternoon to talk about this very important topic about commercial management. My name is Willem Harov. I'm the co-founder and uh, the, the CEO of Dogetters Accounting Group. And our mission is to make a difference in the lives of small business owners so that they can get on top of their numbers and win. If they win, we all win, not only as a business, but as a country as well. One of those business owners uh, I want to introduce to you today is Mbalentle Kobo. She um, is the founder of a company called Ifuto Investments. And Mbali, tell us a bit more about yourself. Hi, everyone. Hi, Willem, and everyone who's present. My name is Mbali Ngobo. I'm from Ifuto Investments, but we trade as Ifuto Paper. So what we do is like how you see your photocopying paper, that photocopying paper that's already in the market, we have our own brand called Ifuto Paper. So what we do is with our source raw material and we have a machine that cuts it into size, we brand it and then we sell it to our targeted audiences. We also have stationery to, as a value add to our services. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us and for taking out the time to share some of your experiences with us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Second up, Simon Magna, one of my colleagues in the industry. He's the, the founder of Iridium Business Solutions. And if there's anybody who can tell us about what happens out there, it is Simon. Simon, how's it? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Willem. Thanks for having me today. Uh, yes, as Willem said, I'm an accountant. Um, some days I'm an accountant. Some days I'm a tech uh, advisor. Um, uh, I really love working with small business owners and helping them grow and build. Uh, and these days, most people love what they do, but they don't love doing the admin and the finance. So we, we become a partner, much like Willem's uh, company does. But we partner with small business owners to help them have great financial information. And we, we hope to grow their business. And uh, it's the easiest selling pitch ever. I tell people, as you grow, I will charge you more. And they go, that sounds like a great deal because I want to grow and you want to charge me more. So we are a match made in heaven. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to some of those war stories we're going to share today. Last but not least, another leader in the industry. Uh, I would like to welcome Paul Kent. 
He's the, the founder of SureSwipe. Most of you would have heard of that company before. Also the co-founder of Adumo. He's, a, you know, he's an award-winning leader in business. Uh, he's been through a, a one or two mergers. He's, he's done a few acquisitions. He's a fintech specialist. Paul, welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thanks very much. I really appreciate the time. And yeah, looking forward to sharing some stories and some of the learnings that certainly, some of the failures, which are often the best learnings that, that I've uh, had over the years. Um, as you say, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Adumo. Um, Adumo was founded in 2019 when we merged some of the South African payments companies uh, namely SureSwipe Innovation and Ikorka. And um, my, my journey in fintech or in payments goes back much further than that. Uh, at a time when fintech was still, uh, still a buzzword in 2008 when I, when I founded SureSwipe. And yeah, as you say, since then we've, uh, we've scaled the company. Um, I've had a great team that's helped me do that. We've had a couple of mergers and acquisitions. And yeah, looking forward to the next hour or so on, on today's call. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. Yes, I mean, we all business owners, and I'm sure you will agree with me, and I've said it in, I think, the first installment, that being a business owner is almost like being punched in the face, not just once, not twice, every day. And then you still have to get up and just move forward, because if you don't, your business goes away. And, and I think you guys will all agree with me, you know, you, you almost, especially in the beginning, before you've really scaled, you're literally a, a jack of all trades. You've got to worry about everything. And, 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 and it's, it's just, it consumes all of you. If you're not careful, you're actually not going to have a life. And there's perhaps an element of that. Um, there's competition. The landscape changes all the time. There's risks here and there. So I wonder, you know, just, just to kick us off, Paul, would you mind just, just briefly help us unpack this whole concept of commercial management? What does it mean? Yeah, so I think in different businesses, slightly different meanings, but certainly the the basis of an, uh, or commercial management in a nutshell really talks about the framework or the guidelines that you have in your organization or the commercial and contractual framework and guidelines in order to deliver to the promise, the services, the solutions that you are offering in your business. So th that's, that's very generic. And, and, but let me tell you a little bit like in our world, what we look at from, you know, it, it's not just around sales, marketing and finance, in our world, we bring in product development, innovation, because you know, the, the input costs and how we go to market and how we price these things, very important um, at the start of your product development, not at the end when you're trying to go to market. Um, the other area that we bring in is service and support. We've got in our world, on, it's, it's great, we've got annuity business. So every month we've got um, revenue that's coming in from the same clients, but that takes a real um, service and support team to make sure that we're keeping them happy, we're delivering to the promise that we made. So, so it's a little bit broader in, in my world than just sales, marketing, and finance. We bring in that level of product development. We bring in that level of uh, service and support. But the other thing that it, it, this really gets around to, how do we make revenue and are we returning, given a return to the capital that you've deployed? How do you manage your cash flow when it comes in here? But the one element that I think it's certainly as your business starts to scale that you look at a lot more deeply and that's what's your risk and liability. Um, do you have the right contracts in place? Are you managing those liabilities and that risk? Are you insured against it? So as those, as you, uh, as entrepreneurs, that's almost risk management is the last thing we think about. But I do say, you know, the earlier you bring that into the conversation, the earlier you bring that into your commercial management, um, you see it a lot more broader. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot uh, included in that, and, and I think that just emphasizes the point I made, that you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, and, and I guess the question everybody's mind out there is, okay, well, it's just me. I'm the, I'm the CEO, I'm the co-founder, I'm the managing director, I'm everything. Where do I start? Bali, you know, so tell us about, about, a bit about your journey. I'm, I'm surely you've thought about all those things as well. Um, uh, as Paul was talking, I was busy nodding my head because I know exactly what he was talking about. And one of the biggest mistakes that I did was not thinking about risks um, at the early beginning of my stage. Well, I do a product, so my um, my 
business model in that stage was just the product. How do I get it out? How do I up my sales? And how do I keep my customers happy um, without thinking the day-to-day -day running of the business and how it would consume me because I was in sales. I was driving at the stage. I was doing almost everything. So um, I'm not going to lie. That's where I would introduce or I would suggest incubation system for um, young entrepreneurs, especially who are like me, who did not have any business background. Because as we, as people, we don't have the same background and we don't have uh, in, uh, the same resources. So um, if you have less resources, I would suggest that maybe find an incubator. There are different incubators. Obviously, we'll talk about that later. But find the incubator that will start from the basics in helping you develop a business model that is OK for you at the time. And as you grow into business and you grow your business, the business model changes. So it's something that you have. I had to visit over and over. So what I was in 2017 starting is definitely different from now. Also, I'm glad you brought up the idea of the incubator and, and definitely we're gonna, I'm going to pick your brain on that in a, a little bit later in the session. I want to okay. ask you, Simon, um, you know, and especially, you know, the proposal that you made to, to, to your clients, you know, you know, they start small and you're going to grow with them. Um, you know, give us a little bit of your insights in, in terms of what you see out there and the clients that you work with when it comes to this topic. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I preach what I do to my clients as well. You know, um, when you start out a business, you've got to come with a dream and an idea and you've got to know what you, problem you're trying to solve. Um, also, running a business is not a charity. You need to make money. So there has to be some kind of commercial viability to what you're doing. Uh, a lot of people that come to us, you know, they start talking to us. I ask them to like succinctly explain their business model, you know, that, that principle of the elevator pitch. If you can't explain to me what you, problem you're solving and why you're doing it in a 30-second trip up to the third floor of the building, you know, you probably don't have a business that you actually know what you're doing. Uh, because a lot of people build something and then I kind of, you know, I, I love picking things apart and trying to understand the fundamentals of it. And I start asking like these leading questions and then guys are like, yeah, yeah, I don't really want to answer that. And I'm like, well, the problem is you actually don't have a viable business. You've built all these structures but it actually doesn't translate to a bottom line that's ever going to make a profit. You know, so I think we, we realized in our business early on is we can provide a service and we can you know, help clients. If we don't price that service correctly and understand what the client wants, um, we may never actually make a profit, even though money is coming in and out. You know, so I, I think that, that I'm sure there's a clever saying, but effectively lots of money in the bank or lots of invoices going out doesn't actually translate to a business that translates to a cash flow operation. You know, and if you don't actually end up with a profit at the end of the month or money in the bank, you're probably going to close down at some point. You know, so I think it's great to really understand those fundamentals, you know, and at the start, you can wing it. You know, I think we all wing it at the start and we do a bit of everything and we realize we way underquoted that client and wait for the contract to end and then we reprice it and start again. But after a while, you've got to get into a nice pattern that the business actually works. And if you can't get there, you know, it's a tough discussion to have with your advisor why you need to pull the plug. Oh, that's excellent. And I like the, the point you make about starting with an idea, a dream. Uh, and many people do start with that. And, and then as you suggested, it, it, it's just a hobby. And so, so I, th I guess part of what we try to unpack then today, guys, is, is how do we connect that dream to the ultimate goal, which is cash in the bank, right? If there's no cash flow, we, we, we don't, don't have a business. So I like the idea, you know, you have to be able to, to, to clearly articulate the dream uh, so that you can convince other people to join you on that journey because along the way, you are, you are going to need, to need help. Paul, uh, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, ahead, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry to disturb you. Just to add on what Simon was saying, it, it was very true. And one thing, um, business, like small business owners or people who are still with, I have ideas converting it into a business, they add a lot of emotions into it. One thing that you, we need to learn is to attach emotion and bring logic. Is it going to make money? Because if a business is not generating revenue, it's still just an idea or an expense. So one thing we need to do is to be logic and not think with our emotions, but think with numbers. 
So, Paul, can, can you maybe help us dive into that? Uh, surely emotions are, are very, uh, very real for most of us, especially as as business owners. How do you avoid falling into that trap? Uh, and, and I think the, what we've been talking about here is ideas, right? And, and I think when we, when we look about the start of a business, and I, I mean, we've probably had this on the, in the startup phases, it's really about, it's not an idea. It's really about understanding what's the problem that you're solving. And the moment that you realize that you're solving somebody's problem, you can then commercialize that. Uh, commercializing your idea is very difficult. You've got to understand well, how, what's the customer and you know, how does this translate into their problem? How are you going to solve it? And what's the value to them? Because the moment you understand the value to your customers, you can understand how you're going to price this. Or, you know, and, and maybe there's, you know, in, in, in many worlds, um, in many businesses, there's already a competitor out there. So is it a value pricing that you're doing? Is it a, a market-led price? Is it a you know, lowest price? Um, and I think these are some of the elements that you certainly have to consider from the first step in, in your business is around how do I price a product in the market that, that is either needed or is already there or there's a competitor in a way that's attractive to my customer. And unless you can get that pricing right and then build your input costs to understand can a profit be made, it's very difficult to start a business. Um, the, the, the emotional side is, is, is very difficult to, to manage. And the one thing we have to be as business owners, the one thing we need as business leaders is the ability to say, this is failing. And it's the hardest thing to do is particularly something that we're very passionate about, something that we started as founders. And then to say, actually, what we're doing today is failing. Can we pivot? Can we do something else? Do we have to start again? Or do we cut our losses? Those are some of the hardest decisions we make as, as, as leaders of businesses. And certainly I've been through it around, you know, products that we've tried to launch to the market that have, you know, the worst products are those that they're almost succeeding, but not quite. Because what that, what that takes away from us is the opportunity cost of working on something that can be amazing. And, and as leaders, that's on us is to make the call, um, hopefully with some advisors that we have, access to around when to cut the plug, when to cut the cord of things that are not working, of things that are failing. The hardest decision we make as leaders. Well, maybe just a, a point on to kind of Paul's comment there. You know, I, um, I, I like to see running a business uh, in, in the same way as kind of playing a, a game. You know, I mean, obviously it's a serious game and there's big stakes on the line, but, but, but I think too many people take business too seriously um, and, and they see it as a personal failing in themselves if it doesn't work, you know, and, and uh, when I got my, one of my earliest jobs I ever got was I worked in a sales uh, job and I had to sell advertising to people in a magazine um, and, and I had to phone them up. And, and unfortunately back then we only had a fax machine to send through the proposals. So um, I, I used to phone people and tell them why they needed to buy something. And those first few phone calls when they just shut me down flat, I felt terrible. I think I had two phone calls and I went home for the day. You know, and after a while, I realized that, you know, the best way to deal with it is to really believe in what I'm providing. And if someone says no to me, they're actually missing out and they're losing out. And I convince myself that they're losing out every time they say no. You know, and I think that kind of philosophy works really well in running a business because I believe that buying paper from me is the best opportunity you can do. And if I'm Bali, I'm going out to my clients going, we are great. We've got an amazing service. You want to work with us. And when you say no, you're actually losing out. And I think that kind of positivity kind of is infectious around you and your team buys into it. You, you, you kind of build a culture that people want to follow, you know, and then suddenly, you know, people are like, hey, how are you so successful? You got lucky. And I'm like, it's not really lucky when you kind of build on a, you know, a, a kind of structure and move forward. And when one or two things go wrong, I don't go, I'm a terrible guy. I should just give up. Maybe I should go get a real job at some other place and, you know, give up on my dream. You know, so perspective is very important. I like what you say. And one of the things I always uh, tell my team is that you've got to be relentlessly optimistic as a business owner. And it's quite different from being hopelessly optimistic. You know, the former speaks to an element of realism and understanding in terms of where you are. And so based on what you guys said, I want to quickly answer one of the questions. Um, Anzani Matebula is, is, is basically asking, how, how do you give a good pitch to your client, especially if you're a big client that will bring revenue. 
Um, and 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 what what I heard you guys say, uh, you know, Paul, you 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 said talked about uh, starting with a problem, understanding what it is that you that you want to solve, so that you can be razor sharp, speaking to the point that's going to keep that customer awake at night, and you almost position yourself as the solution to that problem. And 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 Simon, I'm hearing you say that well, you got to be confident in what you what you do, and knowing that you are actually able to 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 solve that problem. Bali, what are your perspectives on that question? You know, how can you give a good pitch that will be a winning pitch? Paul and Simon have 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 put it on point. First, start with the pro problem. Explain why why is it that they need you and how you're going to be a solution to them. And also that gives them that confidence that oh she she, she or he did a research about us, so he's confident like he has worked on no, getting to know us as a company better. So he knows what we are suffering from or what are our weaknesses and he is coming with a possible solution um, to our problem So yes simon uh, simon uh, did touch on the confident on um know your product you that there's no beating around the bush on that one you need to know your product and to a point whereby when they don't work with you it's their loss <laughs> so simon uh, said it nice and flat there. You just have to be confident and go straight to, to the point. Some people don't really have the whole day and so and, and don't get out, out my biggest mistake on my very first pitch I remember. I was looking at them on the eyes and I saw their face not nodding. They were playing. It was our very first pitch and I, I lacked confidence and I think I screwed things. I, I, I just fumbled after that. So just pretend there are your little dollies in your closet or pretend there are. <laughs> I just put something that will make you uh, like eliminate the fear. Be confident, go straight to the point and um, Pin, point out to your value add. What value are you adding? Because customers are not passive. They very, they're not passive. You not tell them what to do, and then they will do. They will ask you questions. So you need to know your competitors, and you need to be able to answer the question: Why should I buy from you and not them? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for that. So, so Sagrin Moodley is making the point that you know many people start up and they have great difficulty maintaining it, and I think that. That sentence alone speaks to so many aspects of what we want to try and cover today. Um, Paul, I mean, you've gone through startups, especially, you know, fintech startups, eh? and, and it's probably one of the most difficult, uh, you know, business models to, to really make a success of. How did you maintain a momentum? Yeah, so it's taken me back a few years to around uh, 2008 when we started SureSwipe. Um, I think the one thing we were quite fortunate, it, it was spun out of an of a established company. So we did have some good backers. Um, we did have access to some support, particularly around, um, I'm going to say like a shared services, which is access to finance uh, or financial people, financial management, which, which helped us um, immensely. And what that allowed us to do is to focus on the thing that we wanted to do best, and that's sales and service and support. And so, so what what we did, we set up our business initially with those eight people. Um, by the time we'd we'd merged it in in 2019, it was about 140, 150 people. So, you know, in, in at one stage we were 30, 40, 50 people a year. We were doubling up and more than doubling, and and that that becomes very difficult to manage. And, you know, we talk about cultural aspects, but also around performance. Um, which, which really, when, when we started looking at that, it really gets down to, you know, what are the KPIs? What are the measurements? What are the drivers of your business? And these are important things to have in place almost from day one. I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, we've got to understand what's going to move the needle of the business. What are the drivers that we can impact today that's going to give us a result tomorrow, next week, next month? And, and because of how we set up our business structure initially, where we focused on those things that, one, differentiate us in the market, provide us with a competitive advantage, and also would um, allow us to almost shift the needle on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis um, and get the support on those other things that, that are really more administrative. It allowed us to be very nimble, very entrepreneurial. And the one thing that we, that we did, which was quite different to other fintechs, certainly at the time, is you know, fintechs today 
I think particularly in the payments world, there's a massive capital outlay that's needed in order to build the product and service and getting it to a level that can compete in the market. We were quite early. So we, we actually, a lot, of our, um, a lot of our product offering even, we actually outsourced. And we had with, with service providers that were um, a variable cost. In other words, when we made money, we paid them. Uh, and, and so as we, as we grew, it was great from a, from a growth curve, but it got quite quickly, I think probably Simon's model, it, it can start looking quite expensive. And then we brought things in house. So, so it allowed us to, to go to market under, uh, under this variable cost model. It, mean, it meant we had many service providers that we had to manage. Um, we looked at those and said, you know, what is critical to our service offering? And we bring those in house first. And what can, what is really admin and support? And we left those to last in terms of bringing them in-house, keeping this variable cost model, which when you up, when you get started, it's very inexpensive. But as you scale the business, it can become expensive. And you've just got to keep your eye on when do you bring these things in-house? And first of all, bring the things in-house that provide you with a competitive advantage over your peers. So, so you've mentioned an interesting concept called KPIs. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody uh, that's tuning in today knows what a KPI is, but uh, I guess you're referring to a key performance indicator, right? And, and yeah. And, and so that, that, in my mind, really speaks to measuring it. Um, it it's it's, it's, it's the, the, the culmination of the question, what does success look like? So we come up with the idea, we get started, we're passionate, we don't want this just to be a hobby, we want this to ultimately give us cash in the bank. We still have this disconnect between the dream, the idea, and do we have cash in the bank? So I guess what I'm hearing you say is there's a lot of things that we need to measure along the way that will give us clues and hints in terms of whether we are moving in the right direction. Um, this is to all of us. Can we, can we talk about that? What, what would you guys say are the, are the most important things we need to measure uh, that will help us on that journey? Simon, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question, but I mean, it probably also talks to what are we doing? You know, so if you tell me what you're doing, uh, I'm going to tell you what your KPIs are going to be, you know, as a business person. And so if I'm talking to Mbali, I'm going to say, what do you do? And she's going to tell me, um, you know, we brand paper products and we sell stationary products. So I'm going to go, cool, Bali, one of your metrics is probably going to be a turnover-based metric and maybe a volume-based metric. And you probably want to have a budget year on year and you're going to have targeted numbers you want to hit for the year. So you're going to tell me that you want to grow revenue over the year by 30% and you maybe want to have a GP target of 42%. And if you hit that GP, then you're happy and you want to keep an operational cost of X for the year and your, your increase of staffing and other you know, things like that. And if you plan that all out, you know, then when the year kind of rolls out and you get through the year, you know what you're expecting. So you hopefully plan financially better. But when you hit those numbers, you can do the thing that most people forget to do is pop the champagne and high five each other because it's a freaking lonely walk to running a business. If you don't high five yourself along the way, you're never happy, are you? Because you're always like chasing the next goal. And if you ask any businessman, you know, what's his goal? He'll probably tell you just a little bit more, you know, but if you ask any businessman, what's your goal for this year? He's got a number or she's got a number. And when you hit that number, that's when you're supposed to go slow down team. We've exceeded our goal for the year. If we keep going, we can, but we need to like do it within a reasonable realm. Otherwise things get unmanageable. You, know, you obviously don't tell that to your shareholders because they want you to shoot for the, you know, the moon every time. But, but as a business owner, you need to know internally where you're at. You know? So when you need to push, when you need to slow down. You know, and I love nothing more than hitting my goals. You know? So we, we, we've got like a revenue goal in our company. We know we want to grow because we're a service business. So for, for growth in our business, it's growing the service revenue. And, and I have my metrics for the year. You know? So we, we hit our metrics for March already. So I'm happy. So if any other client comes out of line this month, it's great, but I don't need it for this month because I'm on track, you know, and I think it's very, very important to have those things down. So that, that's why, you know, what I think. And, and every business owner should be able to tell anyone, what are your top three metrics that can signal success for your business? And if you don't know that, that's a fundamental problem. Bali, in your, in your business, what are your top three metrics? 
I'm putting you on the spot now. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's such an up um, a target on sales. Basically, I break it down on weekly, monthly, and obviously knowing how am I going to reach those uh, targets. So basically, you just um, scale on how you're going to reach a customer by cold, cold, cold selling, direct marketing, direct selling, and all those things. And um, on that stage is to, well, because I sell a product, I need to know how much product or how much uh, paper I need to sell to break even. And to break even, I have I have to have calculated my cost of sales and the operation um, operation cost. So I, got in Bali. I said everything. Yes, yes, Simon knows everything. So um, it, it does differ with businesses, but with me, because I sell a product basically setting up a target weekly, monthly, and of course yearly. And from there is to know it, and they have to be realistic. Um, so then from there is the know it's how to, how to reach those targets and how to reach those customers and then from there it's very important to know because i deal with the product the cost of sale how much is it costing me to, to to make this product and other operational costs so that i'll see okay i need to sell x amount of boxes to break even and then then i'll know if the 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 net is going to be in the brackets or it's going to be positive and <laughs> that's a very important indicator of popping a champagne or going back to the growing board. Paul, you, you, you also mentioned things like customer journey or customer success, product development, and, and, and all those things that are perhaps in some sense a little bit more unique to your business, but it, I think it is very uh, applicable to other businesses as well. What are some of the things that you usually measure uh, to track success in those areas? Yeah, so when we look at uh, KPIs, our key performance indicators, we, we go a little bit, start, let's start at the beginning, right? And this is really around what, what's the vision that we have for this business? And we start there. And for us, we want to, you know, reshape, reconstitute the payment industry for the benefit of all. We think that it's been, um, we, it's been, to use the phrase, milked by those large incumbents that have been around for many, many years. And there's an opportunity for nimble fintechs like us to really reshape this and change it. And not just that because we're greedy and we can benefit from this. I think the, our customers, the retailers can benefit, which gets passed on to their customers, which are the consumers. So we really think that we can do that. Um, and then we go down to say, well, what's our strategy that's linked to that vision? And for us, we've got a five-year strategy um, that you, know, you can have one year, three year, five year, you know, some countries have 50 year strategies. And so it really depends on the life cycle of your business and the market and industry or the sector that you play in. And for us, five years, we've got uh, investors in the company that are private equity investors and they've, you know, those, they've got an exit timeline and we kind of framed it. Um, five years does make sense because things do move quickly, but you know, there's a lot of work to do, but it also framed within the exit of our private equity shareholders. So you know, there's a little bit of those things worked out in that. And then based on those, those um, strategic and that strategy, and ours is really around a growth strategy. And within there, one of the things is we want to build a world-class team. How do we access in the fintech world the right resources that is going to allow us to deliver and execute on our strategy? So, so building and developing a world-class team is one of those kind of um, strategic pillars. The other one is, is around our product differentiation. Um, we work in a payments world with very vanilla product. What are we doing that's going to differentiate us in the market from our competitors? So that's the product development side. And then when it gets down into the KPIs, they have to map back to those strategic pillars. You know, otherwise, we measure in something that's not strategically important. So this is the mapping that we do from vision to strategy to KPIs, looking um, from sorry, strategy then to budget for the year and then to your KPIs. Um, and... And the budget gives us a real view of our financial indicators. So what's important at a financial level, revenue, growth, GP, and EBITDA. Those are kind of our three key financial indicators that we measure in our business. Then we look at our strategic indicators. And because financial talks about what we're doing today, the strategy or the strategic indicators talks about what we're going to be doing next year and, the, and, and beyond. So we, we like to measure both. Um, we... We, um, we, we measure people at the end of the year based on how they perform to their KPIs. 
and that gives us a um, some people have got a bonus link to that. Other people, it's how we, how we measure our increases on an annual basis. Those that shoot the lights out get more than those that don't. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the meritocracy of, of how we operate. That's what we want to do. So when we look at things like the strategic indicators, it could be um, delivery of the product or in our world, we acquired some businesses and we did that because we can cross sell. So one of my KPIs as the CEO is to drive collaboration across our businesses. And that's gonna be measured around how many customers do we have with more than one product that we offer. As, so that's my KPI, one of my strategic KPIs that we look at on an annual basis. But you know, as we go down to different roles, those KPIs differ to our CSAT, our customer service, uh, customer satisfaction survey for the call center. But, we see that of how it links back to the net growth that we have, uh, which is, you know, one of the strategic uh, pillars is, is growth. So every single KPI we have for every single person in our organization links back to the five strategic pillars that we have um, within, the, within the business. So, so what I'm hearing everybody say is that it's not just good enough to look at the bottom line and how much money is in the bank. Uh, if, if, if we are truly serious about not only doing a hobby, but actually running a business, we got to make sure there's alignment between that dream and ultimately how that translates into the cash I'm going to take home and enjoy as a business owner. And, and what's, what's key that is coming through here is that we got we got to find all those measures that qualitatively will tell us that this dream is actually busy translating into either growth to my top line, more sales or more customers, or it's going to maybe contribute to us delivering better quality services and products to the market. Uh, it's going to perhaps help us become more efficient, uh, which ultimately helps us make more profit. And then ultimately we'll get to, we'll get to more cash flow. That's a mouthful. Yeah. There's, there's quite a lot uh, in there, Paul. Willem, can I add one thing to that? Because I think it's also important on, we, I spoke a little bit about failure earlier. And as entrepreneurs, we don't want to know that we failed when we run out of money. <laughs> so when, when, when we plan for the, the launch of a product or a business, we've got to understand what the budget is, what those KPIs are that we need to track towards. And if we're not getting there, cut our losses earlier rather than later. I mean, and, and, and that's the art around, you know, do you yes. cut them too early or too late? That, that I can't, uh, you know, there is a bit of art in that. But, but putting the KPIs in place tell us two things. Are we being successful or are we failing? And yeah. rather let's fail sooner than fail when we've lost all of our money. And I think that's what I also heard Simon uh, insinuate in the beginning by saying that, you know, when they start working with new customers, they first talk, look at, look at the business model, you know, is there, is there viability behind this? And, and that's a great example of companies like Iridium working with their clients, not only count the, you know, count the money at the end of the day, but it's also giving them real strategic advice to help them, you know, them along, along that journey. Um, Simon, give us a few examples where, where you see people getting it wrong when we talk about, you know, measuring. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think, Normally what I find is it's not that people get it wrong with the measuring, it's the people don't measure. Um, you know, if, if I asked every single person on this call today, um, what are the things you need to do in your business to make it better? I guarantee you each of those people are gonna give me five or six. Okay, and my next question is gonna be, what are you doing to fix those five or six things? And they're gonna look sheepish and tell me they're not doing anything. So I don't think there's ever a lack of ideas in any business owner. And I don't think any business owner, yeah, there, there's a few exceptions, but generally most people know what they should be doing and they know kind of how they should be doing it. What they don't do is they don't iterate on that idea and they don't solve all the little problems around it. And that they, don't, they don't have this like um, curious desire to solve the problem. You know, for me, I get excited when I go home at the end of the day when I know there was a problem we didn't quite solve. And, and I, you know, while I'm riding my bike the next morning or going to gym or, you know, doing something, it kind of plays in my head, you know, and then suddenly it comes to me, I know how to solve it or I know the next step, you know. And, and I think if you don't go to sleep or wake up in the morning as a business owner and kind of know a few problems you need to be solving and what the next step is, you know, then you've got a question, are you really cut out to run a business? 
because there's always problems to solve. If we ask Paul right now, do you have 10 problems you need to solve? He'll probably give me 100. Uh, and that's the idea. A business is never done. We are always improving on it. We're always making it better. It's like my back garden. I've got great tomatoes in there today. They'll be dead in three months' time, and I'll have to plant something else. You're always kind of refining it, you know, and you need to kickstart it, adjust it, change it. And all the metrics we spoke about earlier are just guidelines of telling you how you're doing along the way. Because as it grows bigger and bigger, you need more ways of getting information back to the owner of the business of how we're doing. And if you don't put all those things in place, I'm going to go to sleep at night worrying that the rest of my team hasn't done their job. I can't ask everyone how they're doing. I need to have an easy way to get that information and, and keep going. I'm sure this all, you know, to our listeners might seem very overwhelming. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, because we, you know, we've got, we've, I want to get to some of those questions as well. Um, Bali, I want to ask you, just, just in terms of making this practical, I'm a business owner, I'm, I'm you know, I'm about to scale where do I go for help? What, what, what is out there that could potentially help me take the next step as a leader in the business? Okay. Uh, well, with my case, it was incubation. And there are two types of incubators. You get the basics. One, it's usually government incubators. They'll start you from scratch. I did mention this before that as human beings, we're not coming from the same background. I came from a background where starting a business was something that was not on the table. For me, from the background that I was coming from, a successful person is a person who works for the government as a teacher or a nurse. So I did have no one to back up or fall upon, ask questions. I just had an idea and through the internet that, and the platforms that are available on the internet, that's the only information I had. So I first started the incubator that started from started me from scratch in uh, understanding the legalities what is the ck document why should i be registered as a vet what are the advantages and all those things they'll teach you why are you in business and the only reason to be in business besides creating jobs is to make profit and how you then um, start from that idea or to scale that idea if it's going to be resellable or can be made commercial. And then the second incubator is usually sponsored by uh, big private companies. Like, you know, you know, um, big companies will have CSIs and then they will um, rather put that money into helping small businesses scale. They call business accelerators. And I know RaceCorp, they are at Tumklanga, just to name a few. Now, those take... Um, entrepreneurs who are already in operation, but now they don't know their KPIs. They don't know how to scale or make it big. They don't know the, how to calculate their GP. And you know, all those things that make the business scale up or expand. So I would say a person has to go back to the as a personal drawing board and ask themselves where they are. And we mustn't um, be afraid to maybe scale down a business. For example, when I started the cutting business, I didn't start it as buying a machine and getting it into a market because I knew I didn't have relevant business um, knowledge. I started reselling what was already in the market so that I could understand the market, understand um, money coming in and money coming out. So I, the incubation system started me from there in understanding that and saving up to now purchasing the machine, creating my own brand and, and, and reintroducing myself to a market as a photo paper. So that's where an entrepreneur has to be honest with themselves in where their knowledge is are and they must not lie and, and and lie and say, no, I know one, two, three, then I should know one, two, three. So it's not, there's nothing wrong with actually starting from scratch um, and, and, and building up. Obviously there are disadvantages with the government incubators. They may take long to approve you, might be on the long list. Um, with the private um, incubators, they may want their names attached to your business, or they may want to use, well, with us, uh, BE level one businesses, they might, want to use that. So those are things that people have to be on the lookout on as well. And um, in terms of the incubators, you've got personal experience. For those people who are interested in that, you know, what would be the first step they need to take to get going? 
Okay, with the government incubators, we have CEDA, we have NYDA, of which I'm a beneficiary of NYDA, and I can tell you from experience that the waiting list is long. So yeah. another thing they can do is to go to their local municipality. Um, I'm in Palito, so mine was Guadalupe, and ask them as a municipality if they have anything in place to assist them um, on, 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 on incubation system. Every municipality should have it. Um, 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 other than that, so they should go online and find um, the private ones that are sponsored by um, uh, big companies. It's just that unfortunately, those ones they will want financial records. They will mm. want they will they will they will assess you because they need to know that um, your business now is now in motion. They want a business that is already in motion that is already invoicing because sometimes if you're lucky, they give you a grant. Um, a grant is obviously money that they will give to your business without you returning it uh, with the purpose of helping you, but you'll need to produce um, uh, facts of what you did with that money or reports on what you did with that money. So they have to be like, every, like Coca-Cola, they have CSI, Mondi have CSI, almost mm. every big business, Hollywood beds have CSI. So they need to search the big, big businesses that are already on the uh, on the spot, I know SAP as well. They have um, um, uh, an incubator for twelve months, but that's for those. Those are for people who are already in motion and are struggling to expand or to grow. So it's clusters information. It is something that I would advise everyone who knows that they don't have a business background to actually go for. Thanks for that. That's that's super helpful. So so maybe as a last question before we get to the questions to, to both Paul and Simon, if if the incubator route is not for you, what would you recommend? You know, wh where does one start? You know, to to to, to go on that journey to get the help. Okay. In? All right. Um, there's something called um, chambers. I'm not sure if you know chamber. We have Etewini chamber, um, Ilemba yes. chamber. That those will build you networking and that will teach you a business language and that will help you sell, sell yourself um, or put yourself out there um, or get a mentor, basically, or get Simon, basically. <laughs> you can get Thank you, Bali, like but, Simon. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure Willem knows lots of good answers, but <laughs> maybe my two cents on that topic as well, Willem, like um, uh, Mbali made a good point earlier, you know, all of us come from different backgrounds and have different accesses to networks. Uh, and, and I think the answer is, you know, as much as a lot of us are very proud when we start our own business that we're going to work it out ourselves, you know, throw pride out the window and ask. Yes. You know, yes. I, I, I love going to places where there's like a speaker and there's a whole lot of business owners listening to a speaker. Yes. Um, you know, either you learn from the speaker or you have a, mm -hmm. you go and chat to one of the other people there, but everyone's got something to share. You know, and I think that your job as a business owner is to learn from every place you can. If you've got family members that own three businesses and you can learn the road from them, that's great. You know, if, if we asked, uh, you know, Paul, how did he learn fintech and how did he understand about the, you know, the credit card payment gateway space and how did he get it? He'll probably say there weren't a lot of people willing to share information, but if I knocked on yes. enough doors, I learned stuff, you know, and, and that's how I started my business. I didn't know half the things you know, in, in the cloud accounting space, I started following people on LinkedIn and Twitter and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I just found anyone I could. And when you ask them, hey, can I have five minutes of your time to ask you a question? They're happy to give it to you. So I, I think it comes back to my point earlier. You need to have an inquiring mind who wants to learn. Yes. Um, you need to have an ability to learn and take on information. And if you keep knocking on enough doors with enough determination and people see that you've actually put in the effort, you will get it right, but you need to be relentless in that determination. I think Simon's absolutely yeah. right. Um, if you if you guys go onto the website where you registered for this course, there's a blog on commercial management. And one of the points that's made in the blog is that you need to be good at networking. And, and that point to, to asking the question, that's what networking is all about. And, and I can't think of a better place than, than LinkedIn if you don't know where else to go than, than, than that to go and network. And I find in the business community, especially today, that people are so open and willing to help other businesses. That it's, that's, that's, that's great advice, um, Simon. Thanks for, thanks for giving that. G guys, I want to 
see how many of the questions we can we can deal with. We've got about nine minutes to the end. Um, Nanga is asking, how, how do you identify, assess, and manage your business risks? That's a broad question, right? Where do I, where do we start? What, what could go wrong, Willem? That's a great question to ask. Mm. You know, what what keeps you up at night? What are you most worried about? That's uh -huh. your biggest business risk. Paul, what's your take on that? So it's it, it's so broad, and it's um, <clears throat> every business has got different risks. Um, and in, in our world at the moment, one of our biggest risks is accessing the talented resources because it, they're just, you know, they're in such demand in the technology space. That's a massive risk to the growth of our business. So it's very, very difficult to say, you know, on a broad specter. But, but I think Simon nailed it on the head. It's yes. like, what are the things that keep me awake at night? Certainly that's one of them. And, and that's a good place and, to start, right? It's, a, it's the best place to start because the, nobody understands the business better than the, the founder, better than the CEO, and that's running it. And it really gets down to, is it really is around like what's top of mind because those risks are always in the top of your head, always in the top of your mind. And, and that's the best place to start. But I think there's a, there's a framework. It's like, what's, what's the financial risks? What's the product risks? What's the client risks? What's the legal risks? So you can go through those areas of business and come up with one or two in each area it's a great starting point. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's that's good advice. Thanks for that. The the, the, the next question, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and group a few together. There's there's a question about confidence. Uh, earlier in the in the session, we spoke about having the confidence. Um, how do we how do we gain and how do we maintain that confidence? It's a real practical one. You you're gonna fake it, Willem, when you start. Yeah? Because none of us have confidence founded in any substance. Um, and what, what most of us lack in life is we, we all think we're imposters. We all think, how did I get this far? You know, you get asked to speak on a panel like this and go, Simon is a business expert. He knows all the answers. And I'm like, I'm still learning. I can give you my list of 20 things I don't know. Uh, and, and the reality is you need to build off things, you know. So and you, you need to be confident in where you are at that stage and not comparing yourself to people you shouldn't. You know, yes. so if I go and compare myself to Elon Musk, I'm going to look like a fraud. You know, if I go and compare myself to a person who's been in business for eight to 10 years doing a similar thing to me, I've got a comparable thing. And now my confidence is placed in, in the right space, you know, and, and um, if you really, really lack confidence, go and unpack that and understand it better. But I, I do understand it's a problem. And I speak to a lot of business owners who say, look, I don't know, I'm, I'm not confident, I can't do this. Unfortunately, running a business does require confidence, you know, either in your technical ability or in the way your business is carrying out its service. So if you don't have that confidence, you either need to get a partner who you can work together with that's yes. going to allow you to be that. Um, or, or, or you need to say, well, maybe you're better off being someone who supports another person. You know, they, they, there's a great need in every business for a 2IC or a 3IC who supports the visionary. You know, a visionary in a business is the person who comes up with the big ideas and leads the direction, you know, and um, not everyone is cut out for that. Um, and when you know what, you, what you're good at doing, you know, that's probably the secret. Eh? Work out what you're great at doing. You know, to Paul's point in his business, if his job is to, to one of the key things is to make sure there's a cross-pollination of clients across all his businesses, and he knows he's great at connecting, then the more time he spends doing that, the better he is it. You know, and if he knows he's really bad at admin, any admin he's doing is a fail. You know, so kind of work out what you're good at doing, focus on that. And, and, and it's a learning thing. Eh, Willem? We, we're going to fail and we're going to try again and we're going to hopefully get it right eventually. And if I can link it back to one of the points Paul made earlier, I think it also comes back to really have a deep understanding of your client's problems. I think if, if that's your starting point and you really know that, that that is what the problem is and that's what you're trying to solve, it, it actually supports you. That actually is what gives you the confidence that you're on the right track. Hey, Paul? Well, I think one, one thing to add, it's exactly right. And I think, you know, you, you, you need to know your business. You need to become an expert in what you do. And if it gets down to things like the pitch, uh, because that's, that's very important. I think Mabali mentioned it earlier. It's like practice, practice, practice. You've got to get in front of the mirror and you've got to practice your pitch. You've yes. got to practice it and say it out loud. And that gives you confidence. Simple little tools like that really, really help. And I think this point seems Ch to resonate with, with Google Etu. I mean, she also emphasizes that we need to understand our clients who we're serving and what 
problems we're solving in Bali. Uh, just to add on what Paul was saying, uh, break down your presentation into four. Your pitch in 30 minutes for networking purposes, if you're asking me, what am I doing? You don't need a pitch. You just need to, uh, need, you need me to go to direct to the point. One minute, three minutes, 30, 30 minutes for those pitches, and then uh, associate yourself, go to places and associate yourself where you can actually practice the things. Um, that's how you build confidence in moving forward. Awesome, thanks so much. We, we, we've come, or nearly come to the end, and just before I announce the, the winners of the, of the two take a lot vouchers, I wanna offer each one of you last final opportunity to give us a final word of wisdom. Um, um, Simon, starting with you. Cool. Yeah, I, I think business is supposed to be fun. I, I, I love my job. I don't feel it's work. It's something that I wake up every morning and I'm excited to go and do. Um, if you wake up in the morning and you're not excited to do what you're doing, you need to question it and, and find things that are enjoyable. I think that's, that's what makes it so much easier to do. And then if I'm working in the evening because I have to get something done, it doesn't feel like work. I'm building, you know, so that's, that, that's my takeaway. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate you, you joining us this afternoon. Paul, uh, final words of wisdom from you. Sure. I think, um, I mean, think first of all, you know, you start in a business, I think build it around a vision. And that's the key thing. I think be very purposeful around the culture that you're trying to build and around the value set that you have as an organization. We've used, we've, we've lent back on our values many times in making decisions and uh, tough decisions. And unless you set those boundaries, unless you set those values up front, it's very difficult to make a decision around it. That could lead you astray. Um, measure, um, plan, plan and measure. And finally, is like self-development. Yes. Always be learning. And, and whether that's formal learning, informal learning, um, leaning on mentors, whatever it is, but you can never stop learning uh, about yourself, about your business, about the competitors, about the future. Um, so... Yeah, I hope that's I hope that uh, resounds with people. I hope that helps. Thanks for your time this afternoon, Paul. We really appreciate it. Bali, last but not least, and what you said about the, the incubators, I can really see that it resonated with the audience. Thanks so much yes. for sharing your 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 uh, views on that. Final Thanks. word from you. Uh, three. Uh, Paul has said it. Learn, learn, and learn, and learn. Two. Don't be afraid to start small while you have a bigger vision on, on, the, on the picture. Three, I always say this, a business is like a wheelbarrow. If you don't push it, it ain't going to work. That's it. That's it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us in Bali. So, so thanks, everyone, to the, to, to the audience as well. Thanks for joining us. Um, believe me that, that even though this is the last installment of the Entrepreneurial Bootcamp, the, the, the guys at Online X are already working on future webinars. Watch this space. There's going to be tons of value flowing from this channel. Uh, I, I promise you that. And so thank you for making the time. The winners of the Take A Lot vouchers for today are, can I have a drum roll, anyone? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well done to Sagrin Moodley and Guguletu Matlangu. You are our winners today and you will be contacted shortly for, for your vouchers. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your week. Want to find great? Follow me. <laughs> New listings. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find it on Yelp. Yelp has a range of great traders and suppliers. Those are artists. Let me take you to the painters. There you go.